Okay, hello everyone and welcome to um, podcast two. Hi Nick. Hi Tom. Um, and it's, today's topic is how to get a job in teaching or training. Um, obviously our qualifications are designed for people looking to get into either teaching within a college, um, within a school or going to the private um, training world. So what we're hoping to do today really is sort of have a chat through the different options that you can get involved in training or teaching. Um, share some of our own experiences um, and give some advice on that, I guess, and hopefully people will find it useful because um, we get a lot of calls, don't we, on the phones um, during the day, someone looking maybe to change their career or looking for a bit different, mm. looking at how we're actually going to go about doing it. So, um, Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, some of our, uh, our, our qualifications, which you specialise in, are the Level 3 Award in Education Training, the Level 4 Certificate in Education Training, the Level 5 Diploma in education and training. Also, we do get a lot of phone calls regarding QTLS as well. So we can talk about all of those different avenues today, the private training sector, of course, and really distinguish uh, what it means to go into those different courses, uh, the guided learning hours, and also outcomes as well. So careers, how to apply for a teaching job as well, mm. and opportunities really stemming from each type of qualification. Yeah, well, I, guess, I guess sort of coming with train aid or going down the sort of suite of qualifications we do, um, it, it's, a, it's an alternative route, isn't it? Because a lot yeah. of people are familiar with PGCE. Of course. Um, so they've, got, they've been to university, they've got a degree, and they've, always, they've either now decided they want to go into teaching mm. um, or, you know, or they've already ha always had that plan. So they then go and do their PGCE year yep to become qualified, which you can do to get qualified in primary school teaching, secondary or further education. Mm. For those that don't know further education, obviously like the post 16 sector teaching adults. Mm. Um, so a lot of people know about the PGC, but maybe they don't know about the alternative route of, course. of sort of the education and training. So you could have been a hairdresser for a lot of years. You could have been a beauty therapist. You could have been in the care industry, in um, childcare. And the, the education and training qualifications essentially enable you to then go into teaching mm. um, those subjects without going to uni, without having a degree, um, which is, you know, a sort of a, a common question. So it is, a, it is an alternative route, yeah. um, which means you can, you can sort of do it on the side as you're still doing your mm. day job. Um, and it's about the tenth of the price, essentially, isn't it, of a PGCE? You're absolutely right. With a PGCE, a, a typical uh, price cost of a PGCE, you're looking between nine to ten thousand pounds. And bearing in mind, you're not going to be working. You're not going to have a salary during mm. that year as well. So it can put quite a strain. Um, on you, you have to be very, very committed and realise that you want to become a primary, a secondary or a further uh, education teacher. And, you know, a PGC is a fantastic route. However, we do know of other options available, such as level three, four and five. OK, if you could perhaps work within um, the, the voluntary teaching sector, uh, school or college and you know, uh, further education establishments as well. Yeah. Um, but there are many, many sort of alternative routes to that PGCE, respectfully. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the, um, I guess the beauty of this sort of suite of qualifications, it is, an, it is another route in. Mm. Um, I guess really, you know, probably be quite useful to share, share our own experience. We had different routes into teaching, didn't we, ourselves? Yeah, so absolutely. me personally, <laughs> I studied sports science at university didn't really, wasn't sure what I wanted to do and went straight from um, doing a sort of master's at uni in sports science to applying for a job in an inner city uh, London college. And I think they just, they just took a good chance on me really, went along for interview, but I didn't have any formal teaching qualification, mm. hadn't done any teaching before. So I went straight into this college and I actually worked for a year yeah. Um, without actually doing any sort of teacher training qualification, which sounds a bit mad and bizarre, but there, there are more opportunities within further education, I would say, than there mm. are for primary and secondary for that sort of, I mean, I obviously had the subject knowledge. And then what I ended up doing is teaching for a year, because um, they, they, they mm. told me, oh, you'd be too busy to be able to do teacher training, which is a bit bizarre, to be honest. I mean, you wouldn't really recommend that mm. because you should really get some sort of guidance in that first year. Um, 
But then I, what I went on, and I had basically, once I started my second year of teaching there, um, at a, um, another college, I used to go one evening a week. That was a two-year part-time cert ed certificate in education, mm. which I don't think exists anymore. This was probably, you know, about 20 years ago. Um, but um, I did it part-time. And I think I, the, the cert ed, what I got, is the equivalent of, like, the level five diploma yes, now. Um, yeah. So it was teacher status mm. in the post-16 sector. So I did it on the Thursday night, six till nine, um, over two years, and that's how I did my um, teacher training. It was, it was pretty full on, to be honest, at the time, because you teach all day, don't you? And then you you've do. got to go um, into it. But yeah, essentially, that's how I did it. And I, then I got qualified, um, and then I was classes, you know, qualified status, and then it sort of worked in terms of um, going up the pay scales and stuff. But we've probably come on to that um, a bit later. But yeah, so your routine was a bit different as well, wasn't it? It was slightly different. Um, so my my subject area is uh, sports science. So I did my did my degree, uh, had a year out uh, abroad, uh, sports coaching. Came back, and then that time out made me realise I wanted to go into into teaching. And I had a look um, at a number of different uh, local schools. And I secured a teaching assistant role, teaching assistant and yeah. cover supervisor, specialising within uh, sport as well. And uh, I stayed at the school for, for roughly three years and they were super supportive. Um, they um, gave me uh, a bit more responsibility um, each year. So moving away from a teaching assistant role mm. uh, and teaching uh, BTEC sports. Um, and also taking games lessons as well, um, after school clubs. And I also, uh, during my time, I went to evening college and I took what was known as the, the PETALS qualification. So preparing to teach in the lifelong learning sector, more commonly known as the level three award in education training now. Um, really enjoyed that qualification. And I approached the school and I said I would like to take uh, my level four kettles mm. or the level four certificate as it's known now. Um, and they said, yes, fantastic. So I logged my 30 teaching hours. I was observed uh, three times by the senior leadership team. And it was a fantastic way of transitioning from a uh, teaching assistant uh, to a more uh, I'd say a more focused teacher. So you got your level four kettles. Level four did, kettles. You didn't go on to level five dettles there, did you? Not, or not? not during no. that time. And then you and I met because you came to the sit form college that we were working at. That's correct. Um, where we worked in the same department. But then you, so then you, you didn't go on to the dettles, did you? Then you did PGCE, did you? PGCE right? within further uh, education. Um, so this PGCE was um, developed by uh, Canterbury uh, University. And so it was split over two years. Um, I was teaching uh, full time um, as a BTEC uh, sports teacher. So it was very much studying uh, in the evenings over two years. Mm. Um, How so did you it, find that? It was um, a very uh, it was a very manageable experience because, um, of course, I was teaching, I was studying, but also I had a, a salary as well. Um, and that's what made it very, very flexible. And the college were extremely uh, helpful and supportive. And after those two years, of course, um, they did have a, a teaching position mm. available for me. So it was a very, um, I would say it was quite a long journey into becoming fully, fully qualified, but it was worth it. Yeah. And I enjoyed the experience. Yeah, I used to struggle though on the, on the three hour sessions and the evenings. It is a tough, isn't it, mm. at the end of the day? Um, to go and do that sort of motivational wise and then all the assignments and coursework that goes with it. So it, it can be tough, I think, sort of traditional teacher training on the three hours on an evening. It is, it is tough if you're, if you're new to a role and when you, when you go mm. to a new teaching position, you often have loads of planning, loads of marking. Of course. And then you've obviously got on top of that this sort of... Uh, um, sitting in and, and learning and then all the coursework that comes with it yourself. I think what's key um, to, to balancing it all is having a supportive mentor or a supporter. So someone who is perhaps an experienced teacher, not necessarily within the same subject field as you, but who you can meet with perhaps weekly or bi-weekly and just to see how you're managing your time, your assignments, your marking mm. and your, your teaching responsibilities. 
And if you've got a supportive school or college, then it makes that teacher training period a lot more streamlined, in my opinion. Mm. You've always been a model student now, haven't you? Um, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think I uh, collaborate well, uh, working within a team of, of teachers, uh, sharing resources, for example, um, is, is key. Um, but I think that's a, a good hallmark of any teacher is to, to collaborate and, of course, um, just be, be honest if perhaps you need more time to mark and uh, just to share good practice, ultimately. I guess what we want to we want to we want to give an, an indication of not just going into sort of schools and colleges though, but also there's a lot of people that want to go into the private training world, which is still teaching, obviously. Uh, which probably to start with, we've mentioned you mentioned Petals, which the updated version of Petals, the Level Three Award in Education mm -hmm. and Training, um, which is one of our main courses. Um, we've been doing it for well over ten years now. Um, deliver it in a you know a couple of different formats, don't we? We've got our online course, uh, three day classroom course or our video Zoom course. But that, I would say, in my opinion, that is the, the gold standard for the for if mm. you want to go into the private training world. Uh, that is, the, that is the, the minimum requirement, essentially. Um, uh, absolutely. This, this gains you your trainer status, your, your, I guess your teacher status, your trainer <coughs> status. It's the first qualification on the teaching and training ladder. It's fully accredited, so it's yours for life. It does not expire. And the beauty of this qualification is you can teach any course, any subject um, that you have yourself. So over the years, we've seen a, a, you know, many, many different uh, candidates from the world of security, construction, uh, marketing, for example, uh, the public services, police, ambulance service, sports, sports, yeah, okay, the care, care sector. Yeah. And they're looking to create their, their own training, aren't they? And deliver training perhaps in-house and yeah. also perhaps to become a freelance trainer as well. Essentially, it's an accredited trainer-trainer. Mm. A lot of people hear the term trainer-trainer. So you, if people might want to go and study a qualification and do health and safety in it. And then people say, I'll oh, do the trainer-trainer for it. Do the trainer-trainer for that course, for that course. You don't need to keep doing trainer-trainer. Mm. The idea of the level three award in education and training, if you get it on your CV... Yep you have an accredited, um, nationally recognised qualification that says you are capable of imparting your knowledge. Mm. So therefore, what qualifications you're qualified in, you can then go and deliver. So first aid, a massive one for us. We've got a lot of people that want to be first aid trainers. Course, they yeah. have to have the level three award in education and training, or above or equivalent, um, and have to have um, an up-to-date first aid at work qualification. Mm. Once they've got those two, they can go off and deliver first aid. We have a lot of people in the care industry. They want to deliver the, the mandatory care courses, manual handling, food safety, medicine, um, all those fire, health, and within, within mm. like, obviously the care sector. And so as long as they're qualified in all of those areas and they've got the level three award, they can then deliver that um, to their colleagues. So there's a lot of people within the private training world. You've got both sides, really. They've worked for a company and they've decided you know, they're, they're sort of managers that they're going to be an in-house trainer. Mm. Um, so they need the level three award for that. Or we get a lot of people that are freelance trainers or want to become a freelance mm. trainer. And they're going to go off into the private training world, um, set themselves up. Essentially, mm. um, what I did originally when I set Train Aid up, um, obviously I was working in the um, sort of college sector in further education. Um, but decided wanted to start, you know, have a go at my own thing. Knew I was already qualified as a teacher, had an up-to-date first aid at work, so I realised that I could deliver first aid training um, and started doing it um, a little bit sort of at the weekends, evenings, um, sort of, you know, holidays. And I was, and, and that's how, how you can get into it. You deliver your half-day, one-day training courses. Um, and, it, you know, that's, it's, I guess there's not many... Within the freelance training world, particularly, I guess, over the last couple of years with the sort of uh, COVID environment, people have lost their jobs. Mm. Um, we've had a lot of people from yep. the airlines around this area that, you know, have lost their jobs within it. And there's not many sort of jobs you can go down the route of retraining so quickly. Mm. Because essentially, you can get your level three award in education and training. If you wanted to, you'd get it in a week. You can. Um, and then you might already be qualified within some of the subjects you want to teach. So you're almost up and running um, pretty quickly. You can't change careers, can you, in many 
areas like that quite so quickly. A hundred percent. And I think that's the beauty of the level three award in education and training. Yes, you can deliver in-house training um, within your own field uh, to your current employer, or you can change direction. You can set up your own training company. Like you said, if you've, uh, if you've lost your jobs, you know, you can now take the ball by the horns and set up your own training company, being a freelance trainer. There's well, yeah, on, 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 that, on that point, I think it's a good point. Yeah, so you, people are asking us, how do you, you become a freelance trainer? Okay, so you can set yourself up, you get your level three award. It's unlikely that then you're going to get flooded nope. with, you know, all your own jobs and be able to go, yeah, I'll fully book my calendar up for the next year. That's mm. pretty unlikely. Um, I mean, there might be some people that hit the jackpot. That does occur. But in reality, so you get qualified. Mm. You're interested in going into the freelance training world. Best thing you can do, you know, we, we work with, a, you know, a, a lot of freelance trainers we that, we, you know, that we call upon as and when we we need them. Um, but a lot of the good ones, you know, they're, they're proactive. They're working for several companies like us. Yeah. OK, so you fill your diary up. Um, you work for several companies. Then, obviously, if you're successful and you're good at what you do, you might start to get some of your own courses. And that might mm. be where you develop and then you maybe start your own company and you're running your own courses. But to start with, it's certainly good to you know get in contact and network uh, once you've got your qualifications to go down that route. And just another thing with the Level 3 Awards in Education Training, it's recognised by very much all awarding bodies everyone knows the level three award in education and training so whether you are a specialist within the fitness industry the care setting although some people still call it petals some but, people but it is, still it is, call it is it the petals. same qualification yeah construction so if you gain this qualification it's nationally recognized that is the one to gain okay mm. and um, i think that um, if you gain this qualification um, you know, as you said there, you might specialise within first aid only. And if you're a freelance trainer, you could deliver other courses. Um, you could deliver health and safety courses, leadership and management. So by being a freelance trainer, you don't need to be pigeonholed just to one area to make it more uh, interesting your your day to day role. You could go into different companies, deliver training into schools into care settings as well. So the more qualifications you get, I guess the more opportunities and variety it adds to your to your working role. Mm. And you know, it's quite exciting. You could develop your own website. Uh, you could add uh, perhaps branding to your own car or vehicle. You could produce flyers to get your name out there as yeah, well. Yeah, we used to have a little train things. over mobiles, didn't we, cruising I remember around? That. Had a couple of those, yeah. Yeah, no, there's, there's lots you can do. So, I mean, yeah, so that I guess that's like the level three award education training. You, you're a qualified trainer. Some people, that's it. They're in the private training world. They don't necessarily need to go on and do further qualifications. No. Um, but for some people, that might be the first step towards maybe going further and going into a sort of a more traditional teaching role within a of college course. or a school, um, which I guess leads us slightly on to the next level up, the level four certificate in education and training, um, which is the level three, we probably didn't quite mention, is, is designed for anyone, really. It's, so they could already be training because they've been doing it informally mm. in-house or someone, someone's given an opportunity, uh, but they don't necessarily have to be, and you could be completely new to it. Whereas once you go to level four and level five, the term is like current practitioners. Mm. So someone's actually already doing some teaching or, you know, or, or training within the, either area, um, and they have to log obviously 30 hours of their teaching as part of the practical evidence of the course. So I always saw, I always think in the level four, if I look at it, is for a more experienced trainer who's looking to, you know, go to the next level, hone in their skills, um, or for someone, you know, who's thinking, right, I want to get into the school college scene. I want to become a formal teacher, mm. essentially. That's what it's sort of design for isn't it absolutely and i remember taking my uh level four certificate in education and training at kettles as it was uh, known back then and the school that i was working at were very very supportive they said no problem you can take 30 uh, teaching hours i remember teaching a range of both practical sports and also theory so it was a nice blend of uh, different subjects uh, there and by working within, say, a teaching assistant role, I knew I was going to be supported 
uh, by my colleagues who wanted me to progress and do well mm. and they could, I guess, see some potential in me becoming a full-time teacher one day. And I think that's the thing about education and training mm. is that the beauty of it is, uh, you know, everyone wants you to do well and progress as a teacher and be the best that you can be. Yeah. And if you do move on to another school or college, you know, more often than not, you know, your colleagues will be supportive of you with, with moving on and getting a, a new challenge um, as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think personally, the level four certificate, I think it's a good stepping stone mm. to the level five. So the level five is someone that's gains teacher status, fully qualified teacher in further education. Mm. But there might be people who have dipped their toe in the private training world thinking oh, I'm quite enjoying this, I quite like this. Yep. I'm not sure if I can fully commit to a level five, which we know, you know, realistically is going to take at least mm. a sort of academic year to complete. Um, so why not have a go at the level four? Okay, it's a good qualification to get. Some people teach in further education, don't go yeah. beyond the level four. It is still, you know, still sort of highly regarded. Um, and it can also... You can RPL, people don't know what RPL means, you can you can use what you do mm. towards your level four, um, you know, you've got to do six units on it, but you can claim two of the units from a level five. So it's not like if someone does a level four and then they're then wasting mm. money and time to then go into the level five yeah. afterwards. I think it's a good bridging course, uh, particularly if people aren't quite as experienced, do the level four, um, gain the knowledge and the practice from that. Mm. And then maybe you can make your mind. Some people might be doing it and think, well, I'm, I'm sticking to the private training world. There's no need for me to go on and do the level five now. Mm. I've got a, you know, a significant training qualification. Others are thinking, right, yeah, you know, I really want to get involved in further education. I want to, have, I want to be able to look for you know, full-time teaching positions in FE or schools. Mm. Um, and then they might then progress on to the level five. So the level five, the diploma in education and training, um, Previously, Dettles, as we yep. sort of mentioned, the old names. And some of those old names do still stick a bit. Um, but yeah, and so those doing the level five, that is, um, you know, that is your teacher status. Not always promoted as well yes. as it should be. So when we say a PGCE in further education, you're then a fully qualified teacher in FE. Mm. The level five is the equivalent, isn't it? Of um, course. It's not yep. such a high level um, as a PGCE. What level is a PGCE? Level six, I believe. Level six or level seven, six I'm not or sure. Seven, yeah. um, but ultimately, it is teacher status yeah. at level five in further education. Of course. Um, and that means, which is not all about money, obviously, a lot of people aren't going into teaching for the money, it's more of a vocation, but it's still important. That means you're then on, you know, your class as a fully qualified teacher and you're on the, the fully qualified fully qualified teacher pay scale, aren't you, essentially? Of course, absolutely. Yeah. Anyone with a level five will have a very strong application to a, a college, um, a sixth form college. And as you said there, in terms of like, uh, you know, qualified teacher pay, you're recognised, you're a fully qualified teacher, and therefore you would be on uh, a teacher's salary, you know, after gaining the level five mm. as well. One thing with the level five for anyone who's embarking on it, it is a big commitment, um, is logging 100 teaching hours. You have to be observed eight times over that duration. So you, do, you do need the teaching position, don't you? That's what you we, do. we come across that sometimes. So sometimes might phone us up, they decide they want to go into teaching, I want to do mm. a level five, but they've got no avenue for teaching. So you yes. you don't have to be teaching at the time you sign up, but you really, our recommendation is you've got some sort of, you know, mm. in or sort of connection and you've got some teaching coming up because you've got to log 100 hours of teaching. It um, is. And yep. it's got to be formal teaching in the sense that, you know, it's there's lesson plans, resources, it's mm. structured. Um, um, having said that, I guess it's important to stress, we were talking earlier about how this is an alternative route to the PGCE. It is. The Level yeah. 5 diploma can be quite a mixture of teaching hours, can't it? So it of can course. be voluntary hours. Yep. Um, then it certainly doesn't have to be paid. Um, could, can be part-time, full-time, mm. and can be a real mixture um, yep. of different avenues. So we've had people, you know, that might be teaching some hours in a community centre, uh, might be doing some other, other hours volunteering someone else, and maybe mm. a few hours in a college. So it's... You know, it's, it, it's got that sort of flexibility yeah. to it, hasn't it? This this sort of suite and direction of within the qualifications. Absolutely, and, and, we, and we, of course, we've had some people within the private uh, private sector doing the level five. Um, so they could be teaching 
to, to colleagues, they could be a training manager within, within an organization, within a company, and you know, they, they want to, to further their, their teaching knowledge. And so it doesn't have to be catered just towards um, you know, colleges or schools. You can do the level five That's a good point, yeah. within the private training sector. We've had, uh, for example, uh, international students doing the level five abroad within a school or college or, or companies as mm. well. So it really is, it's down to you uh, in terms of, you know, what you are teaching. Being within train yeah. their own trainers, you know, they've gone through the, the level three and four of us and they want to do level five because it's, they want to, they want to better themselves. It's they like do. CPD. They want to get the highest teaching sort of qualification they can get and, and, and why not? And we're quite happy to back, you know, um, our trainers that want to do that because ultimately, mm -hmm. why are you doing it? To improve yourself as yeah. a teacher or a trainer. Just getting the level five doesn't mean that's it, you're done, you, that's it. You, you know, we, mm. we all know if you've been in teaching like us for, um, you know, 20 years, you never stop learning. Never stop. Um, so you mm. get your teaching qualification and then you go on and, you you know, the whole time you're delivering, you're learning new stuff. But that's why you do it. To, to ref I, always, I like the term reflective practice and that's why mm. you, you've got to be a current practitioner to do it. So you're doing the qualification. There's a lot of theory within them. Um, you know, some people love the theory, some people not so much. I'm not. Don't, you know, I, I don't mind the theories. I prefer them once you've been teaching mm. and you've got the experience and then you can look at a theory and think, all oh, right, actually, I can see how that works and maybe think about how you might do things differently um, sort of next time round. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, I guess, and what pops up a lot for us is people want to do the level five diploma, okay, mm. but do they necessarily want to teach in sick forms or further education? A lot of them want to get into secondary schools, don't they? They do. Um, personally, never taught the sort of 11 to 16 year olds. I've always sort of taught mm. adults, but there's a lot of people that want to, want to get into that and involved in that. And it's worth mentioning that this pathway does also allow that, doesn't it? Which sort of brings us on to your sort of area of expertise and the sort of QTLS pathway? Yeah, QTLS, uh, so QTLS for anyone who doesn't know stands for Qualified Teacher of, of Learning and Skills. Okay. I often get asked that on the phone and I can never remember. But essentially that is teacher status in secondary and primary. It's what mm. you can, once you've got your level five diploma and you've got your teacher status mm. in the post 16 adult sector, you can then apply for your QTLS um, with the Society for Education and Training to get parity with secondary or primary and actually be qualified within those sectors too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm a huge advocate of QTLS. Um, I did this uh, back in 2015, quite a while ago now, and it took me six months to, to gain. So it's all about CPD, improving yourself as a teacher. Yes, you've achieved your level five or your, your PGCE within further education. So it's not actually, it's important to stress actually, it's not actually a course, is it? Or a, it's not like a like level, level five diploma is a qualification, isn't That's it? That's correct. But QTLS, they class it as a status. Status, yeah. status. very so, important. So as you said, it's an online, um, the Society of Education and Training have a, sort of have windows, mm. don't they, a couple of year. They do. And it's an online sort of portal. It is. And you basically log your current practice reflections you do and and prove i guess essentially why you you're also you know it's i guess it's transferable the qualification and skills you've got mm. and you then gain that's why you end up gaining teacher status within the secondary and primary as well absolutely and it's recognizing that you still have areas for development so you will have a, a mentor with your your, your status so you need to have someone who is a supporter within your organization this should really be someone who is an experienced practitioner who can observe you at the start and also at the end of the the process and you will have to submit things like a lesson observation report yeah and you will have to do very much an analysis of yourself, taking stock of your strengths and also areas for development. You need to also log your CPD and really show, you know, how you are working to, to improve on your areas for development. It could be, for example, attending inset days or delivering training to your own department, for example, chairing a meeting mm. could be quite daunting as a newly qualified teacher, but it's the only way that you can get 
more experienced. Mm. On that point, a mentor, we probably didn't mention that earlier. So that's, yeah, it, obviously you need a mentor to do mm. the QTLS, but we would strongly recommend a mentor for the level five diploma as well. Wouldn't you? So if you're going to do that, and you're mm. particularly if you're within a school or college in a traditional role, then it's, it's, it's quite important to have a mentor. Obviously, we're here, we support you know mm. our learners through the qualification, but if you've got someone within your organisation that's maybe already teacher qualified, then that can be a big help, can't it? Because the level five is a mm. significant qualification. It's not a degree, but it's, it's not far off. Um, mm. And you know, and if you know, if you're if you're if you're in a university and you're studying for a degree, you'd expect to have you know a tutor, the support, the mentor sort of role within mm. it. So it's essentially it is important within um, that. If it, I mean, not everyone can. We know if yep. you said if they're in the maybe if they're on their own in the freelance training world, then obviously we you know we can still support them and, and look to, to help them in that manner. But it does help if you've got someone within your organisation. Yeah, absolutely. So this this mentor it or supporter, if you're studying on the level five, your, your mentor supporter should have a, really a level five teaching qualification or higher, such as a PGCE. Uh, so they can give the best advice. They could be observing you and mm. they've been through the process before so they can see what makes good teaching and they can, of course, make you become a much more well-rounded teacher and they can give you honest uh, advice and, and best practice. So I think having a mentor is, is going to be key. Mm. Just on the level five, we've had learners get through and achieve the qualification within five to six months, but in all honesty, you know, this should take between nine to 12 months, depending on your, your, your teaching hours, you might have lots of hours. And if, if this takes 18 months to gain the level five, so be it, okay, mm. but there's no time pressures on how long the level five teaching qualification needs to be. Yeah, I mean, we've always worked like that really, haven't we? Because people mm. come to you in, in such different roles, individuals, some of them are, you know, in a full-time teaching position, mm. they've got other stuff going out and personal-wise in terms of time. So we never like to really put too much pressure on people because it mm. does depend on your circumstances, how quickly you're going to get of it course. done. Yeah. But it's not, the level five is not designed to be wrapped up in a few months. No. It's designed that you're on it for, you know, an academic year or more and you're actually as you're on the course and you're studying and you're learning, you're actually reflecting and improving as a teacher. Um, the level three, the introduction one, that is different. So we teach that quite concisely. A lot mm. of people get that done in a month or so. That's the in, in entry level one. That is. But the, once you go to the four and five, they're designed to be completed over a longer period and you develop as a teacher or a trainer during your time on those courses. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I think we've given, we've obviously gone through, you know, how you get levels three, four and five QTLS, talked about the role of these qualifications, how their roots in, but I guess as well, people might find it quite useful. So if you are thinking of going into it, apart from signing up to a qualifications, what else can you do? Um, so I guess to make yourself more attractive because people are looking, aren't they sort of, at, of uh, job adverts and trying to look for a, a pathway in. So I guess the first thing we always advocate is yes, go and, if you haven't got a teaching qualification, of go course. and and you and you've not really got any hours lined up, you're not sure what to do, go and do the level three awards in education and yep. training. Because mm. for the I mean for the it's not that expensive in reality, um, right. considering once you've got it, it's on your C V, you can then run training qualifications. It can be done, you know, reasonably quickly. And I always, I always say to people, it shows a certain proactiveness, doesn't it? If you're, if you're approaching training companies or colleges or schools, and you're like, okay, like I'm really keen to get involved, you know, or maybe I've been working in the beauty industry for a lot of years. They've got mm. the experience, and they want to go, go into a college and teach. But I've also gone out my way, and I've got the level three of all education and training. It shows a certain sort of motivation and willingness, doesn't it? So. Then some of the colleagues might look at that and think, okay, right, they've, they've got the experience, then they've interviewed well, they've got the level three, which is like, okay, it's not, doesn't mean they're a teacher, mm. they're a qualified trainer, if you like, but we can go with that and we can then maybe, some colleges will then help fund the level four level or five four. if they take on a teaching position. So I think it certainly shows a willingness, doesn't it, doing the level three. Absolutely. And I think one key thing as well is the 15-minute the micro teach as well. So I have known uh, previous uh, learners of ours who have uh, secured a, a teaching position within a school or college, and they've often are asked during interview, 
oh, by the way, what was your 15 minute uh, micro teach? So for people who aren't aware, basically the practical assessment mm. on the level three award is a is a fifteen minute micro teach, a it mini is. lesson. It is. So learners yeah. have to deliver a fifteen minute session on the subject of their choice, and it it's a fantastic day, isn't it, in terms mm. of how you see people on the course blossom. Of course, but it, not necessarily those that are already in the teaching training world, but people who've come along on day one, never really done any teaching themselves. On the final day. Now they deliver their 15 minute micro teach to their peers. They watch everyone else's and it's generally it's just a sort of great day. And it's, you see people grow, don't you, in confidence and sort of leave. Um, mm. It's normally a lot of nervous energy on that sort of day, but that's another reason to go and do the level three, isn't it? Because, mm. you know, if you're thinking about going into it and then we, we have people come back, don't we, after a couple of years, did the level three of us, and now freelance trainer running their own um, business, and they'll say, oh, it was really inspiring, like, was the best course I ever did, really, you know, thanks so much. So it's definitely a good starting point, the level three award, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, and, and just going back <coughs> ourselves, we've seen many, many different, um, different subjects, you know, and, you know, um, every time we, uh, we attend, we deliver a level three teaching course, we're always seeing new new teaching techniques mm. uh we, we always, learn ourselves we, from the micro teachers we learn we? ourselves yeah. so we're always learning we see sort of new icebreakers new activities being being developed so we're keeping our own uh, subject knowledge and mm. uh, pedagogy uh current we are seeing uh what what's new out there as well and just going back to that point about interviews if you if you've done your level three awards in education training you, you go to an interview um, and you, 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 you explain, you know, what you did for your 15 minute micro teach, your, your passion, whatever you perhaps delivered there, whether it was a subject or a hobby, you could maybe take that forward within a school or, or college. You could maybe develop um, or, or host an extracurricular club, for example. You could create a new society as well. Mm. So schools, colleges, um, any establishment. Uh, are looking for staff members to to put on something an activity which they're passionate about okay it could be something that really grows yeah as well the, so what i would also recommend is if you're looking to get into the teaching training world is you you know it doesn't have to be all formal mm. um so if you're just looking to gain some teaching experience and you i don't know your, your son or daughter down at a local scouts or guides or you know they're doing something in the community even like within sports or coaching or in a school get down there get involved it doesn't all have to be formal because obviously there's yep. a lot of stuff there where you could be leading and you know and if you're going for interviews and they're saying well actually i've got my level three award um i've got that i haven't got any formal teaching experience but i have done this and i have done mm. that and in actual fact a lot of that is teaching of course, and I think enthusiasm, your, your sheer motivation uh, shines through. Mm. And you can, of course, go to an interview and saying what you have done and how is that transferable to the future. And if you've got that, you know, that, that, that input, that willingness to, to learn new subjects, um, you know, perhaps securing a teaching position and shadowing teachers. Shadowing, good shadowing point. Teachers, yep, shadowing, definitely. Um, and doesn't all have to be paid, does it, to start with? I think people nope. some have to get over that sort of um, thought pattern. So, yeah, if you, you, know, if you were wanted to go into um, teaching childcare, obviously mm. a lot of the FE colleges have their childcare departments, early years departments, send a letter or an email, mm. um, follow up with a phone call. I'm really keen to get involved in this. I'm, I'm currently doing my level three of all education training. I've got, you know, 10 years experience within it. Mm. Cat, would you mind if I came in? And shadowed. I mean, I ran a sports department, obviously, in a sixth form college, and we used to get people to make contact. I remember over the years from both the colleges I worked in, people that just sort of showed a proactiveness, showed a keenness, a willingness, came in, just helped voluntarily to start with. All of a sudden, you know, a couple of years later, they're there, they're, they're teaching, they're on their PGC program, and so it's, it's, it's not a closed door. I think that's the advantage of this pathway and further education. It's mm. not... It's not one set way of getting in, in and getting involved. And absolutely, and I think if you're if you're thinking about a, a career within teaching and training, and you're really not sure, um, my advice is to to very much go into a school or college 
um, of course, and, and shadow teachers. And then, and only then, will you decide it's 100% for me. So you have to be sure about these That's things. That's very true, yeah. yeah you have to yeah, be sure. Yeah, go in and if it, some people would say, no, this is not for me. I, I can't be mm. dealing with all these 16 to 19-year-olds. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, that, that is true. So it's mm. like many careers, people try things. And it's uh, so, yeah, rather than signing straight up to a of full course. qualification, yeah, certainly go and do that. Um, and I guess just to mention, when people start to become more qualified, if they mm. get their level, got their level four, working towards their level five, where would we sort of where where do you look for teaching sort of jobs and that? What do we? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. I'm a huge advocate, first of all, of TES jobs. Uh, so that's the Times Educational Supplement uh, TES teaching wow. jobs. Okay, I remember I secured my teaching position uh, by looking on TES. It is an easy uh, website to navigate around. You can search. For, for different uh, teaching jobs within your area as well, your subjects, uh, which sector you're looking for as well. The majority of teaching jobs do go on TES jobs. But there's also Read Education as well, uh, yeah. gov.uk as well. So the government uh, teaching website has got a fantastic search engine. So they're there. all quite sort of national ones. But even if you're in your local area, if you just sort yes. of doesn't know, didn't even have to see the job advertised, do you? I would say to people, OK, mm. you've got six or seven colleges around you in your area, you know, contact them all. Contact, mm. go ask for the contact for the department and say, you know, is, is there any opportunities? Might be saying, could I shadow? If you've got any just part-time hours to start with, just come in. And often within FE, there are people moving around, either gaining promotions, going to different positions, yeah. going off with maternity, paternity leave. So often there's cover there. So, mm -hmm. okay, it might only be there's a three-month contract coming up. But if you're looking to get experience and hours, get in there, get that three months experience. Normally, if you do a good job, they're not going to just say sort of cheerio at the end of it. Of so course. it's... Um, yeah, so I guess it's sort of grabbing and grasping what sort of comes your way, isn't it? And when, um, uh, with with schools and colleges, ultimately, they like consistency. They, they don't want a high turnover of, of staff. Um, they would like to keep their, their teachers, develop them further by adding to their own profiles, doing CPD, teaching other subjects as well. So I believe that schools, colleges, they are an investor in people. If they do have that high turnover of staff, it's not going to be good for, for learners, their students. It's going to be quite confusing, have many, many different teachers come through the door. So mm. they do generally like to keep their staff. And in terms of the best times to look out for, for jobs, I would say definitely early April, May time, that's when teachers, they do have to give notice that they are looking to, to move on as well. Mm. And I would, I would seriously so that, recommend yeah, yeah, def, April, that's a good time. That's a good point, but I guess we shouldn't miss out. We're obviously talking about the freelance training world as well. So how do you go about getting a job with a training company like us, TrainAid? So mm. if you think of all the people that work for us over the years, work for us currently, we have a lot of people contact us, don't we? Uh, we do. Just contact us directly. Hi there, you know, I'm a freelance trainer. I've got the teaching assessing qualifications mm. or they want to go into first day, which we do. And, you know, they send us their CV and we, we respond to everyone. Um, yeah, we do. It might not be that we've got any availability at the time, but generally, you know, we'll say someone, thanks very much. Where, where, what area you're in? Because obviously it depends on what location. We run courses all over the country. And then and we'll try and give people an opportunity. If they've, if they've got the qualifications, we normally interview them on the phone, see what mm. they're like. Um, and if we like like the sound of someone, they look good. Then we'll send them in. They'll do like a uh, do a first call, so we we'll see how they get on. And we normally say, no, I mean, if, some, if someone does a is, does a really good job, they're professional, mm -hmm. they're reliable, they deliver a good course, and they're good at all the sort of administration and that. Because ultimately, that's what we want to work with. Mm -hmm. Then then we're likely to give them another course. So I think particularly the the, the freelance or the or the training world, you know, there's a real good way is to be proactive and, and go and contact. You know, if you wanted a big run the sort of courses we do they were contact train a but then go and contact several mm. of our competitors and you know we, we you know you can work for more than more than one training company as we were saying earlier yeah absolutely um so i think just having that enthusiasm that motivation that proactiveness 
and also uh, thinking ahead as well. So perhaps saying, I really enjoyed this course. Um, do you have any upcoming course dates for, for next month? So having that proactiveness mm. and you know very much plotting when you're going to be working. As I said, reaching out to different uh, training providers. And also, if you are perhaps a current uh, practitioner, perhaps thinking of other qualifications you can uh, achieve and then look to deliver them as well. So of course, you might have taught first aid for a number of years, but you could think, oh, what's, what's, what's the latest trend within my sector? Mental health first aid, for example. Mm. Uh, so achieving that qualification with a view to teaching that course. It's more strings to your bow. It means you're not standing still and you're moving with the times. And that's very important for any freelance trainer, teacher even, that you're watching perhaps um, the, the news as well, what's happening within your area, staying current mm. with the standards and also knowledge within your area as well. So I think signing up to different uh, newsletters of awarding bodies is going to keep your, your knowledge current. And that, mm. I think that's a good hallmark of any teacher or trainer. Good point, good point, yeah. Well, I think, I think hopefully we've given a good insight into the, the various routes there. I think what we wanted to end on, we've had a, a few questions from our sort of uh, social media sort of followers on the mm. platforms, on Instagram, Facebook, and sort of the YouTube channel. So um, just going answer, to answer a couple of those, really. Of course, yeah. Um, so one of them that came in was, what qualifications do we need to get into teaching in the voluntary stroke sort of charity sector? Mm. Um I guess we've sort of touched on that. I yeah. guess it's not quite so regulated in reality. So no. you could go and work for maybe for a charity and do a bit of workshops and freelance training. Maybe you wouldn't even have a level three award in education and training. So you yeah. probably could go down that route. Or we mentioned going down sort of, um, I mentioned sort of scouts, guides. I mean, there's, there's probably, they're probably mm. keen. You're going to have to make sure you've got the safeguarding side of things ticked off in terms of, is it DBS? Is it yep. yeah, DBS and that? But... I guess in terms of what you need to go into that, I would say that level three of all in education and training, go and do that. Of course. Um, as we're saying, that is the gold standard. Mm. You might get away with not having it in the charity voluntary sector, but at least you know if you've got it in your own peace of mind, you know you've got the credentials on paper, you've got the skills, mm. um, and it might be you've been doing a little bit of volunteering, but then you haven't got get it, go and do that, and that probably give you more confidence sort of moving forward. And as we said, doing those voluntary hours, maybe work in a charity, that could then lead to paid work if that's the route you're looking to sort of go down. Of course, and with the level three, you can teach accredited courses as well. So of course, you could uh, contact awarding bodies, you can deliver uh, accredited courses on their behalf. So without gaining the level three, then um, you know you wouldn't be able to deliver those accredited mm. courses, say within a charity. Yeah, um, that's so true. That's and I guess I guess the ultimate answer is it isn't really any different no. to the private, the public sector. That mm. there's not different suite of qualifications. So no. what we've been talking about is all relevant for individuals looking to do that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, another one we have, which is one that we have quite a bit actually from our sort of the phone calls and emails we receive here. Can I go straight on to the level five? Diploma in Education and Training. Mm. So I'll let you answer that one. Yeah, yeah, you certainly can. You can go straight onto the level five. That's absolutely fine. So if you're working within um, a supportive uh, teaching environment, so for example, uh, a school, it could be a college or the private training sector, an organization, a company, um, you can go straight onto it, okay? But the main thing is that you have those 100 teaching hours. Um, they are secure. They could be quite regular teaching hours. And that you do have a mentor who has a level five teaching qualification mm. or higher. Such and as, as we said you. earlier, yeah, if you if, don't, don't go on to the level five lightly. So yes, you can go straight on to mm. it. But if you haven't really got hardly any experience, you should really be doing one of the lower levels first as a stepping stone. I absolutely. And I think you've got to think about outcome with the level five. So once you achieve your level five, there has to be uh, a clear vision. Mm. You hopefully have a, a teaching position. There is a carrot at the end of your all your hard work. It, it will take you a year. OK, but um, hopefully there is, um, a, you know, a clear vision. OK, if you achieve your level five, of course, you can look. To, to teach you can in other organizations other sectors but it would be good that you have 
uh, something that you would like to aspire to at the end of it. So don't go into the level five uh, light-hearted, mm. you know, uh, half-hearted. So perhaps if you're looking at, you know, thinking of teaching, then I'd yeah. recommend the level. Yeah, you've three. got to be motivated yeah. to be signing up you to do. level five, definitely. You do. Yeah. Okay, and one one more question that we had. So, so what's the sort of? Um, well, what I guess it, a lot of people want to know what's the the salary, the starting sort of pay for a teacher or a trainer. So, I mean, I guess a trainer, um, the freelance training, well, it does ultimately depend what you're teaching. But if you mm. look at the mandatory training courses like first aid, health and safety, fire, those sorts of ones, I guess a lot of freelance trainers are on a day rate, um, which could range from anything to sort of, I guess, 125 to around the sort of 200 pound mark. Um, 150 mm. to 200, I guess, would be the average for, for sort of freelance training um, day rate, um, just to give people an indication. A half day training course, maybe around about the 100 pound mark. Mm. Um, so that's what people can expect to earn. Obviously, if you fill your calendar up, people work for us sometimes five or six days in a week, then you know that, that does add up. Um, obviously, allow people to do the maths, but it's, 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 it's a significant um, earnings considering we said how quickly you can actually set yourself up as a freelance trainer. Um, mm. So that's an indication of that. And then I guess the teaching world, sort yeah, of what with, someone could expect to earn. Within the teaching world, if, say, you're uh, perhaps an unqualified teacher within a school or college, a typical salary could be between 20 uh, to £22,000 uh, a year. Uh, as a qualified teacher, okay, so let's say you've got your level four, your level five, okay, then you could typically start between twenty-five to twenty-six thousand, um, and that is going to progress. So once you get your teacher status, you're then onto the scale, aren't onto you? Yeah. The scale, yeah. And you each year, um, so if you teach at uh, the school or college or sixth form, it does go up and up. Usually a thousand pounds a year, um, all the way up to thirty-eight thousand, typically. After that, uh, you have to obviously go for perhaps uh, management positions. So it could be a course leader, um, head of department. Uh, a but on that of point, learning. I guess worth mentioning, you don't have yeah. to get to the top of that scale before you apply for a course leader yeah. or head of department. So you could of have, you could be sort of earning. Thirty-two thousand. You've been in the role a few years, but then mm. you, you know, you think you're now in a position and you're confident to go for a head of department, and that obviously makes you know you could make a significant jump in your earnings, couldn't you? Of course, in that and manner. For example, a um, a, a manager um, of a department could perhaps achieve between um, I'd say between forty to £45,000, mm. um, so perhaps a middle And then beyond manager. that, you start going into sort of the senior management positions. Yeah. Um, a lot of the setup of NFV and colleges now have sort of multiple deputies, so there's avenues to get up towards, you know, 50000 if you go down that route and beyond. Of course. Mm. And obviously, um, the independent school sector, so some of our learners do progress into the independent school sector. They are independent, so they are there away from the state Mm. Uh, schools and colleges so independent schools do set their own pay scales they have their own internal pay scale structure so typically it could be more yeah who knows we've had some international students we in international sort of british schools yeah. abroad sort of uh, so that's quite another common area for which we've had students doing our, mm. doing our qualifications yeah um okay yeah i think that's Sort of a good insight. So I've, I've enjoyed this, Nick. So, uh, yeah, thanks for joining me for um, this. Hopefully you've given a bit of an insight for our sort of subscribers and followers on the social media platforms. Yeah, and, um, ab absolutely. And, and if there are any questions, please do send them in to us uh, via email or typically give us a, a call. Uh, we're here in the office. We can answer any questions on which courses is right for you and also perhaps to have a chat about your future mm. teaching or training ambitions as well. What will be interesting though as well is if you, you know, we, we want to do these podcasts regularly. This is our mm. second one. Second send, one. Send, us, send us an idea, a subject, a topic, if there's something you'd like, you know, people want to learn more about um, and we can sort of chat about and share our experiences, then yeah, we'd be good to hear from people. Okay, guys, thanks very much for, for watching or listening to us, and uh, we hope to see you again um, in the near future.